Congratulations, YouTube. You did it. You wore me down and you sucked me back in. I have too many subscribers here just to walk away entirely, especially with no alternative that truly stacks up and so many copycat channels uploading my shows for me anyway. But we can't forget the THC's account here is on thin ice. And so the YouTube version of the show has to be prefaced with this little PSA, only to say that episodes that contain the kinds of themes that have been regularly banned on YouTube will not appear here. And even with that precaution, there's already enough in the archive to get us removed, so remember that the higher side chats could be banned or put in timeout again at any time. And I won't be able to tell you guys about it. So if you feel like it's been too long since you've heard from me here on this digital, dystopian, draconian, data mining monster of a police state seeking platform, your first step should be to check the HigherSideChats.com for the latest shows. All right? All right. Enjoy. Welcome to another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. I know we want to get into the action, but I have to ask that you help me armor us up a bit for the bumpy road ahead. Because I bring you the first hour of this show without unrelated ad nonsense as a proof of concept. And if you value it, then come over to THC Plus for the $8 a month and hear the full two-hour interviews as they were designed to be and as you would enjoy them most. Go to thehiresidechats.com or just click the link in the show notes to get started and within a minute you'll be plugging in your new Plus Show RSS feed into a hopefully decentralized podcasting 2.0 supported app. Feed the things you want to grow and starve the things that gotta go and we will reach the promised land. Think about that and enjoy the show. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Happy days are here again, higher side chatters from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and ever since the state started marching kids to legally mandated public schools, it's been a hotbed for behaviorists and psychologists to study and manipulate the minds of the youth away from the prying eyes of parents and guardians, all under the guise of a tax-funded public service. And everyone knows the elite class gets a completely different education, but nobody seems all that concerned with raising our standard, as they let it slip as low as we'll let it go. But even the structure itself is a psychological mindfuck of Pavlovian training to the sound of bells, a 15-year trap of authoritarian dominance, a daily half-hour in the yard most familiar to prisoners, and a wholesome nutrition of the lowest quality corporate food imaginable. It's never been good, but in the digital age, it's only getting worse. And you might remember today's returning guest, John Kleisick, sounding his alarm early last year when we talked about his book, School World Order, The Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. And before we ever knew the catalyst would be COVID, he wrote the book on all the red flags in education that signaled a move to no classrooms, computer-based learning, adaptive AI software programs, truly permanent blockchain-based records, and an intentional disregard and downplaying of the human touch and teaching, the unquantifiable impact of the right human in the right classroom. He warned us about these things in March of 2020, when we just started to hear the terms mask mandate, vaccine passport, social distancing, and distance learning. And now he's back to break down how it all came to pass in the post-COVID world. John is just the guy to do it, as he's got an MA in English and has taught college rhetoric and research argumentation for over eight years. He's also the director of writing and editing at Black Freighter Productions Books. He holds a black belt in classical Taekwondo, and he is a certified kickboxing instructor under the International Muay Thai Boxing Association. The man who saw the writing on the wall, the Edgar Casey of education, the Taoist professor himself. John, welcome back to the higher side. Hey, Greg. It's an honor to be back. Thanks so much. Oh, man, such a pleasure. And you deserve a serious pat on the back because you called it. You were one of the very few people talking about these things in 2019. 
I had a couple of conversations about iPads in the classroom and the Gates Foundation's massive investment in software-based education. And I would always say to these guests, hey, I understand they want to go this direction, but there would have to be one hell of a catalyst to stop kids from going to school in person with teachers. And, well, one hell of a catalyst we got. To break us in here, let me just ask you if you could add a new chapter to the book about the events of the last year and a half and how kids and schools were affected, what would you say about it? Oh, well, you know, I thought when I wrote the book that I was going to have maybe like 10 years to like warn people as this stuff got slowly implemented and that, you know, it would sound less and less crazy and then people would actually listen to what I had to say about it. You know, if I had to add a new chapter, actually, I've even thought about maybe an ebook. I've written quite a few articles since. I would have to say that distance learning is pretty much here to stay. That and versions of hybrid learning, which we'll get into today. And the goal of that is to data mine the students through all the different types of softwares that I speculated about in the book. So today we'll take a look at some of the newer trends that are picking up. Last time we talked a lot about charter schools and some of these devices. Today we'll talk about something called community schools, which have a relationship to charter schools. And then also look at the history of something called UNESCO Study 11 and how basically all this stuff has been being set up since the early 80s. And I hate to say it because I'm a public educator and I'm active in my union. I'm actually a union officer, but our teachers' unions, at least the upper brass of these unions, are not helping the situation. They seem to be complicit in partnering with corporate ed tech in pushing this agenda. So, you know, I guess the next chapter would be something that focuses on some of the new deregulations like 85 FR 18638, which deregulates distance learning. We look at how we're transitioning from the charter school model to the community school model and how this push towards this thing called the fourth industrial revolution is getting its final nail in the coffin sort of hammered in through these ed tech partnerships that are being forced upon us because of social distancing with the help of teachers unions, sadly. Mm. Well, that is a great introduction. And you sent me a really thorough outline for this, which I appreciate and links to some of your recent bit shoot videos and recent articles. And I know largely from yourself and Allison McDowell's work that the realm of education is a very important domain for the technocratic biosurveillance state's plans. And if we're going to get into this outline, the first bullet point is about an article you wrote for New Politics. What is that article about? So that one is about the dangers of ed tech privatization through this new move towards this thing called community schools. So previously I talked a lot about charter schools, which my book focuses a lot on. And I touched on community schools in the book, but only tangentially. I mainly focused on charter schools as the main instrument for public-private partnerships. So a charter school is a private education corporation that is subsidized with tax dollars. And they largely are geared towards workforce training, and they don't have elected school boards. Those are one of the first instruments of privatization. Looking at how things are going now, I really think that they were meant to be sort of a stepping stone towards the community school. And so the main difference between a community school and a charter school involves something called lifelong learning, public private wraparound services. Okay. And so that means your healthcare services, criminal justice, at-risk prevention, crime prevention for students who are at risk, and then it has a data mining component to track those. Okay, so with the charter school, you pretty much have a public-private partnership, but with the community schools, you have the same thing, except that there is one slight difference, and that is that a community school can have an elected board. Okay. It doesn't have to, though, because they actually have things called community charter schools. So in a lot of ways, especially under the new Cardona administration, the secretary of Ed Cardona, these are kind of being pushed as like the antidote to charter schools, right? And so they're largely pitched as 
you can hear the communitarian rhetoric, like it's more public based. But in the Every Student Succeeds Act, in order to receive federal funding for what is known as a full service community school, you have to implement those wraparound services, which include the health care and the crime prevention. And then you have to data track that. And those have to be funneled through public private partnerships. So they are another element of privatization. Although I would say there's more government involved in that public-private partnership. Right on, right on. Yes, this relates to one of the videos you had sent me. And in the description for that, you talk about how you document the history of community schooling and illustrate this history with several examples of privatized community schooling projects managed by multinational corporations, including IBM and Monsanto, which is quite troubling. Monsanto has a huge incentive to get in front of people young and convince them that they're not a problem. And IBM has a pretty sketchy history too in terms of managing individuals. Uh, so yeah, that those are red flags for sure. But I guess you mentioned Cardana, Miguel Cardana. What's important to know about him? So I think he was chosen largely because he doesn't have a lot of political baggage is one of the main reasons they picked him. He is actually a teacher. He actually has taught, although he moved pretty quickly into administration. And he was a commissioner of education in Connecticut. Early on, before he was picked, there was some moves to maybe get somebody like the president of the American Federation of Teachers Union, Randy Weingarten, in there or other high-up union people like Lily Garcia. I think those people came with too much political baggage as much as they may have wanted them in there. So what they did was they went with Cardona. And Cardona, there's a, a few things that are on his agenda that he talks a lot about. Community schools is on there. But two other buzzwords he likes to use have to do with equity and the other one with these alternative assessments. So basically. The equity has a lot to do with a lot of the uh, CRT stuff, racial justice, social justice stuff. The alternative assessments, which tie into the equity stuff, have to do with the fact that during COVID, right, everybody's learning was disrupted, right? We don't have the traditional systems. And so there's a big call for teachers and administrators to roll back the traditional standardized testing that we would usually hold to rank everybody. So in other words, how fair is it to hold students to these standardized tests if they've had this really crazy year of learning with all this experimental tech and, and all the chaos that it involves? So they want to get rid of the standardized tests, but there is therefore a push for alternative assessments. And what these alternative assessments largely take the shape of is something called performance-based assessments. And the way that they could easily implement this could just be by aggregating all of the learning analytics from the various platforms that the students have been on, right? So you don't even have to take a test, just aggregate all their different scores on all the different adaptive learning software and the learning management services and things like that. And then just aggregate that into a score that says, you know, how competent they are. And I should mention that these performance-based assessments do come out of the community schooling model which was largely pushed by somebody by the name of Linda Darling Hammond. Linda Darling Hammond is the one who advised the Biden transition team to pick Cardona for the Secretary of Education. She was also an advisor to President Obama. And when she was advising Obama, she was pushing something called a portfolio-based approach to, quote, school choice. Now, school choice is a buzzword for public-private partnerships, in other words, charter schools. So she is favorable to both charter schools and community schools as sort of two sides of the same coin. And she's a huge proponent of community schools, and she comes out of that whole community schooling crowd. I should mention that one of the institutions, one of those community schooling institutions is called the Coalition of Essential Schools, and that was set up by somebody called Ted Sizer. And again, in addition to the wraparound services and the data mining, there is also the performance-based assessments that are largely pushed through at tech. And we should just add one more thing, which is that Linda Darling Hammond is the CEO at the Learning Policy Institute at Stanford, and that is funded by the Hewlett 
Foundation, which is the not tax exempt arm of the HP Computer Corporation. Hmm. Wow, man. And you really know how this is all connected and who's responsible. But for people who are listening who maybe have kids in school and are seeing some of this stuff, obviously distance learning through the computer is not great. There are a lot of problems with it. Some people who are still stuck in the COVID fear bubble think it's necessary. But setting that aside, these things are always framed as stuff that is good for the children, advancements and upgrades to education and learning. How do we know that this is more like a Trojan horse? What would you say to people who maybe don't see why this is so negative? Well, the first thing I would say is I recently spent 30 days at Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet's house, and she gave me access to all of her files. It was 36 file cabinets full. It took me 100 hours to go through it. She let me take it all home. I've been building a database with it and uploading it. It literally take me a lifetime. But one of the things that I discovered by digging through all the stuff that she kept for at least 40 years, now it's 50 because it, some of it goes back to the 70s. Some of it goes back to the 60s, but I don't think she was gathering it at that time. But a lot of these buzzwords that you see coming up that seem like they're new and trendy, they've been around forever, basically. I mean, at least for 40 years. Okay, so none of this stuff is new. This has been a long-term agenda. If you look at the key players involved, we mentioned a couple of them. IBM's a big one. Microsoft is another one. Apple is another one. These companies have a long history of not exactly having the people's interest in mind. And then the other part of it that you could look at to see that this is more about corporate profit, data mining, values clarification, social engineering, is that you can look at the way that they even promote the ed tech now, and they always do it with a caveat that, yeah, you know, there's been a lot of learning losses from distance learning, but, you know, we still got to do it because COVID's too dangerous to go back to in-person learning. So they basically admit that it's an inferior product, and then the key players involved are a little bit nefarious, and, you know, they've been driving this agenda single-mindedly for a long time. So I think those are all red flags that it's not for the benefit of the students. Right, right. And it's very coincidental how much foresight they had before this random pandemic, because so much planning and investment was made in these very technologies, and it seems like it fits the mold of problem-reaction-solution. Yeah, definitely. You know, you could even see some of the timelines that they had for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which sometimes they called the Information Revolution. In Zbigniew Brzezinski's Between Two Ages, he calls it the Technotronic Era. And they pretty much all aimed for this same moment in time, around 2020. So if you're a company and you've got your 20, 50 year plan and you're, you know, hanging out at the Trilateral Commission and you're getting together to sort of coordinate things, it's probably not that hard to do, right? To make sure that once ever, all that infrastructure is put in place, that we can have an event that'll necessitate its implementation. Mm -hmm. Well said. And another one of these key things people should understand is something called the Good Lad Study, obviously funded by a lot of the nefarious capstone cabal names and players we've heard before. Tell us about this Good Lad Study. Okay, so John Goodlad was funded with money from the National Institute of Education, which was a branch of the U.S. Department of Education that no longer exists. Several Rockefeller Philanthropies, the Carnegie Institute for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning, and then the Kettering Foundation. And what the Goodlad study did was it created four manuals. This is in the late 70s, some of them early 80s for propagating community schools. And these include a place called schooling, schooling for a global age, and communities and their schools. And there's one called arts in the schools. Okay, and these are all used as basically manuals for teachers to follow protocols for implementing community schools. And I should mention that the Coalition of Essential Schools, where Linda Darling-Hammond, her role at the Coalition of Essential Schools, 
CES, that was set up by somebody named Ted Sizer, okay? And Ted Sizer basically is following the Good Lad study. In fact, he writes the foreword to an updated edition of A Place Called School, which is written by Good Lad. So, again, the Good Lad study is basically the beginning of all the community-based education stuff that they're pushing now, so again, if you know they push it as oh, it's this new foil to charter schools, it's really not right. It's about at least forty years old, maybe getting closer to fifty years old. Okay, and maybe we should mention that from the time of the Good Lad study to when Ted Sizer sort of picks it up, sets up the coalition for essential schools, all the way down to Darling Hammond and now Cardona, there have been consistent funding from some of the same foundations, one of them being the Annenberg Foundation. So Ted Sizer gets $50 million during the Clinton administration to fund his community schools. He came up with this idea of small schools, which was a concept that was picked up by Bill Ayers during the time when that whole scandal with him and Obama, their little connection through the Annenberg Foundation, that was the connection. It was Bill Ayers setting up Small schools, which are community schools. Around that same time, you had the Chicago Annenberg Challenge. Arnie Duncan was involved in that. And later he becomes the Secretary of Education for Obama. Okay. And so from Clinton all the way to Obama and now into the Joe Biden administration, which is basically an extension of the Obama administration, right? We have consistent funding from some of the same foundations, the same pedagogy, the same methodology, the same agenda. Hmm. <laughs> Another tangled web for sure. And you mentioned that we were going to talk about the UNESCO study 11, and this is the next thing on your bullet pointed outline. What is so important about this study? So this is something that I found going through Charlotte's archives, and it basically shows that all of the ed tech stuff, the global infrastructure of it, it's been set up for the past 40 years. So the way I, this is one of the first files I opened up actually. And it was funny as I pulled it out of the manila envelope that it was in, I could see how it was collated right away before I even dug into it to just see how these different blocks worked together. So these documents were given to Charlotte Iserby by somebody by the name of Lawrence P. Grayson. He worked at the National Institute of Education while Charlotte was there. He was the U.S. Department of Education's liaison with UNESCO for at least 10 years. And he was the main liaison with UNESCO Study 11. And so what he had in that file was he had a package of the actual UNESCO Study 11 project which was a partnership between UNESCO and Western capitalist countries and then also Eastern Bloc socialist and communist nations in a regional grouping. And so if you took a look at it, you had the individual white papers from all of the different countries that were involved in addition to the overview document. And what it showed was that there was a combination of, it was basically partnering the multinational Western corporations with the Soviet bloc statecraft. So what I mean by that is that they were partnering with these multinational companies to set up the global markets for exchanging ed tech software. So you could basically ship it all the way across all these borders. But then they were also looking into the socialist and communist statecraft in terms of how they centralize their education system. So it wanted to use the multinational companies to basically distribute the technologies, the ed tech products worldwide, but then domestically in each nation, it wanted to implement centralized modes of socialist or communist statecraft. And there is a previous document before UNESCO Study 11, which went with this collated file, and it had to do with the development of technology in Eastern Bloc Europe. And it literally in there says that socialist countries are at an advantage to implement ed tech because they have a centralized system. So before they started study 11, 
which partnered with these companies, they were already saying that ultimately we want a centralized system to implement it. Okay. And then, so the other things that were in that file were a bunch of academic journals and the academic journals included advertisements from the same companies at tech companies. You have IBM, Microsoft, Apple that were in study 11. The journals also had white papers from study 11 republished. And then through my own research, looking at Charlotte's letters, I was able to uncover how Project Best, which Basic Education Skills Through Technology, which was the document that she leaked and got fired for, basically wanted to set up public-private partnerships that would replace academics with workforce training through Skinner Box computers that psychologically condition the students for workforce competence. And that was basically America's domestic version of the UNESCO Study 11 project. And I discovered that by looking at a series of internal memos that she had from the Department of Education. So basically, UNESCO Study 11 was partnering with Western capitalist countries, Eastern Bloc, communist statecraft, regional partnerships in the United States with Project Best, academic journals, which were publicizing it. And then there was also, he had included in there, were law journals, which were looking into how can we restructure international laws to standardize that distribution of those technologies across borders. Mm. And this is all to set up the fourth industrial revolution. And they called it in those law journals, the information revolution. Right, right. And to talk a little bit more about the actual tools they're using. You mentioned Skinner Box Computers Program for Psychological Conditioning. Tell us a little bit more about that, how it actually applies to a kid using it or any of these technologies that they're currently implementing. What is the real world experience of a child engaging with this technology? So the theory comes out of Stimulus response psychology goes back to Wilhelm Wundt and then is, is changes into behaviorism later and then operant conditioning finally with B.F. Skinner. The whole idea is you use rewards and punishments like animal training to elicit responses. So, you know, instead of Fido's got a treat to get him to sit or to roll over or whatever, you're going to use other rewards like maybe the gold star system right at the school and then maybe punishments and something like detentions that's the early mode of using skinnerian conditioning in the schools so it's a reward and punishment system which basically targets the reflex system or the nervous system to bypass higher order thinking right in other words you don't want the student to be having their own conceptual ideas about how they want to respond to learning stimuli or workforce stimuli, you just want them to have a, a reaction to it. So you take that mechanism, you put it on a computer, the stimuli becomes whatever is the learning stimuli on the digital module. So maybe it's a short answer, a matching question, multiple choice. Okay, your response is going to be, you know, your answer on the matching or the multiple choice. And then based on how effectively you respond to the learning stimuli on the digital device, you're going to either be remediated to improve, or if you're good enough at it, right, you might be accelerated maybe to like, a, I don't know, maybe an advanced AP or a honors course or something like that. But this mechanism of tracking you into remediation or higher learning based on your efficiency or lack thereof in response to the learning stimuli, this is known as the personalized education. It also relates to the performance-based education that we talked about earlier. And so that's basically how it works. Now, I mean, I heard also in that question, like, what is the student's experience? So maybe loaded in that question is like, how effective is it? And do they like it? Um, right. You know, they try to make some of these a little more interactive. So like they'll have like video games. This is called gamified learning involved. And sometimes multimedia video and things like that. And so, you know, that's to, I guess, trigger the reward center more to make it more fun, I suppose. I haven't really looked at any of the simulation video games as of late, but I remember when I was a kid, they had the educational games and I never, uh, <laughs> never thought they were very fun. So I don't know how good they are at triggering the reward system. I remember the Oregon Trail video game. I used to just, all I ever wanted to do was go hunting and shoot the bear. I never wanted to go across the trail anyways, anyways, but so 
do they enjoy it? I can't tell you that. And how effective is it? I would say that, and this is anecdotal, that is the easier you make something, the more you remove the challenges, the less rewarding it actually is, right? And so I would think that that would actually impede the highest levels of achievement. It might get the student who's relatively apathetic to do more, but as far as pushing themselves to dig deeper, I don't think that that mechanism has that involved because it's a very passive system that's basically working at the subliminal level, right? So looking at the lower regions of the brain, more the reptile part of the brain, the limbic system and things like that, it's not really triggering higher order thinking. Mm -hmm. That's a great point about lowering the bar and making things easier to create the perception that kids are just coasting right on through these programs, best and brightest. But, you know, they've been made to be easy. You could think you're doing well and then not find out that you weren't doing that great until it's too late. We all know difficult and uncomfortable challenges make us better and teach us lessons, but we're being conditioned to be soft and comfortable in many ways, but this all seems to be another element of that. But what's also scary to me is it sounds like you're saying that from an early age, kids that rebel or don't thrive in the system will be marked as such. And that stigma is going to follow them through the whole program, potentially. Which would have been a nightmare for me, because I was trouble. But even still, it did feel like good grades were more closely associated with compliance rather than real intelligence. Now that's going to be true on steroids. And kids can get a reputation that can be hard to shake. But to digitize that and connect it to a profile that's even more set in stone... Nobody should be assumed to be a certain way based on their behavior at 10 years old or 15 years old. This is really concerning to me, man, and it starts to sound like the prison system. Good luck getting back on the good track when you've been labeled a felon. It's a pretty sticky label. And in that minority report way, what you're describing sounds pretty similar to prejudging based on some previous mistakes, and it just seems like a dangerous game to be playing with kids. Yeah, definitely. Once upon a time, you know, you might be tracked into the, you know, behavioral disorder group or the, you know, the bad kids, whatever you want to label, they want to give it. Yeah. And, you know, you can come to another teacher next year or in a different class and that teacher might not know anything about that, right? And they might see you perform differently in that class. I mean, I was a bit of a, a, <laughs> was a, bit of a troublemaker myself, and I've been tracked into honors classes, but I also was tracked into remedial classes because I was causing problems in the, <laughs> in the <laughs> honors classes. Sure. But I, I remembered that I did behave differently in different classes based on the teacher. And there were some teachers that just would not let me get away with that stuff. And they would shut me down on day one and I performed fine in there. And those teachers would be like, well, I don't have a problem with them. Why do you have a problem with them? So in other words, that one teacher might hold you to whatever data that you exhibited, you know, early on in the class. But if it's not on a permanent ledger, you know, you at least have the chance that some other teacher might see you differently, might be able to work with you better. And you're not going to be held to this other standard but right if it's on a permanent ledger that follows you with your learning analytics especially on some of this blockchain stuff that they want to integrate before the teacher the next teacher ever sees you they're already going to have a presupposition about you based on this data and then since all of the instruction goes through the module even if the teacher might intuitively see something else going on with the student in a lot of ways they're locked into aggregating that data, they have to incorporate it to their responses in the e-learning module. So it definitely is meant to track you into basically a caste system, I would say. And, you know, you mentioned the whole criminal justice thing. Remember, that's part of the wraparound services. So, you know, it was Kamala Harris who was arresting parents for not bringing their kids to school on time. And the justification for her was, well, People who don't go to school tend to become criminals. So basically, you're contributing to crime by not putting your kids in school. So we're just going to nip it in the butt and put you in jail first. So take that concept 
put it on this permanent ledger and basically say to the student, hey, you're not learning so well. We might need to put you in a crime prevention program, you know, some new D.A.R.E. program or something like that, because, you know, you have the potential to become a criminal down the line just because you don't do so well on your worksheets or your learning module. Yeah, well said. And it seems like there's a Seinfeld episode for everything, but it reminds me of an episode of Seinfeld where Elaine was at the doctor's office and saw her file and it said that she was a difficult patient. And then she got caught looking at it and the doctor writes down something else. And then she switches doctors and then that doctor reads her file and instantly changes the way he interacts with her. And she just can't escape what is written in this file. And it is quite funny, but that's just pen and paper in manila folders that get transferred in a you know physical way. Put that on the blockchain and you'll never escape the perception. And all these people in the club will have this way of looking at you before they even get to you. And it's all predetermined based on how you acted when you were really young. And they know that we all lash out and aren't necessarily our best selves at 14, but that's going to follow through forever. And I think this is, is really super dangerous stuff. And one of the other things on this outline that I thought was really interesting is you write about the teachers union selling out to big tech and that we have some evidence of this through CDC emails. What can you tell us about that? So Americans for Public Trust leaked some emails from the AFT and the NEA to the CDC. And basically they were asking the CDC to tighten up its restrictions. So, you know, all this talk about follow the science, you know, the CDC are experts. Well, if that's the case, why are you telling them to reduce the social distancing from six feet to three feet, right? At the time, the CDC was saying, you know what, you can go back to in-person learning with a three foot social distancing, which to me is silly because it either travels six feet or it doesn't. If you're going to go in half to three feet, might as well just get rid of it entirely, okay? Right. But three feet at least probably gives you enough space where you can probably fit all the kids in the desks at the same time. Six feet's going to require you to use hybrid or blended learning, okay? And so hybrid learning or blended learning is the concept that comes out of the charter school industry. Again, one of the first proponents was the Knowledge is Power program, otherwise known as KIPP. So what it is is basically blended learning can be just where you're, you're actually in the room all day but you're always on a computer and the teacher is basically a facilitator. Yeah. Hybrid learning is more where you're doing that, but half the class is actually at home doing the distance learning. And then half the class is doing the blended learning in the room. And then they alternate days throughout the week. And so I looked at that and it's like, well, that makes sense to me because if you look at the history of both the AFT and the NEA, they have been in bed mainly with IBM, but also with Microsoft, and then obviously it's tax-exempt arm, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, going all the way back to the 1960s. The AFT has been connected to the Rockefeller Foundation for longer, particularly through its founding member, John Dewey, and that's going back basically 100 years. So in other words, both of these unions have a long track record of investing in this whole ed tech system for this fourth industrial revolution. So. The way I saw it was that, you know, they basically want to perpetuate this system to push all the stuff they've been pushing and basically get a return on their investments. So I can break that down with some historical examples, but that seems to be the case because I don't see any other reason why they would go against what the CDC recommends, right? I thought we were all supposed to just blindly do what the CDC says. Right. We're supposed to trust the medical experts, not tell the medical ex experts what we want them to recommend. It's a little bit backwards in that regard. And kind of along the lines of never being able to shake this record, you have a bullet point here about charter schools and cradle to career education. And that's really the crux here. It's like, do we have evidence or even just whispers that are suggesting that these records for young kids will actually result in what jobs they're allowed to have or encouraged to have when they're finished with education? 
Okay, so that would tie into something called the micro-credentialing, and then they have these digital badges, which relate to this thing called Pay for Success, which is in the Every Student Succeeds Act. Allison McDowell does a really good job with her research on that. That's something I haven't dug as much into as she has, but basically it works like this. Okay, these micro-credentials, you can earn these through schools, but usually they're going to be directly from a company, and it's going to be like narrowly defined for specific job skills. And so you get that micro credential and then they put it on a digital badge and then you can use this digital badge as like your workforce competency certificate. And that can improve your chance at getting particular jobs, especially industries where they ask for these types of micro credential digital badges. Okay. And so it's not necessarily that it will force you into that, but another way to say it is, If you want that job, you're going to need it. And then what that also does, though, is it opens up the doors for something called impact investing, which, again, Alice McDonald does an excellent job with her research on that. And basically, it works like this. So there's different ways you can invest for impact financing or social impact financing. Sometimes it's sustainability financing. It can be for gender equity. It can be to improve poverty. Okay, so in the instance of especially a student who comes from an impoverished background, you can funnel basically loans into this student's career pathway based on whether or not they have these micro-credentials or these digital badges. And then that company can basically get subsidized through these pay for success programs in the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so that further incentivizes both the desire and the need for these digital badges, which are going to determine very narrowly specific job skills. So that is one way that we can actually see or track how these career pathways through the cradle to career education works, which, by the way, that cradle to career stuff comes again out of the charter schooling industry, which was set up by, or at least was conceived of, by president of the AFT, Albert Shanker, and he was one of the first people to conceive of it. He didn't really call it charter schools at first, but not too long ago, there was an article by the AFT called Restoring Shanker's Vision for Charter Schools, and it basically says, we're not going to say whether they're good or bad. Let's just talk about how to improve them. And in the meantime, you had Randy Weingarten of the AFT When she was the president of the United Federation of Teachers Union, she ran the UFT charter school. So again, you know, they'll talk about they're against corporatization and privatization and they're they're all about public ed, but they're really more about public-private partnerships for workforce training. Oh, so gross. It's kind of like Boy Scouts merit badges sponsored by Google, Monsanto, or Pfizer. It's like... You've been thoroughly brainwashed with our corporate onboarding already, so you'll fit right in at our company because you got all the little badges already. It's just so gross. The NEA actually has its own micro-credentials that it offers for like teacher training. So, I mean, they directly give you micro-credentials. And then IBM is a big one that does the micro-credentials. But yeah, you know, it's all about, you know, in this new world of obey authorities without asking questions. Those, that's it's perfect, right? You're going to fit right in. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really Orwellian and dark, if you ask me. But, you know, it is what it is. That's why we expose these things. And you also have here some stuff about current or recent AFT Rockefeller connections, things like the Washington, D.C. Public TV Partnership for English Language Learners. What's that about? That partnership is run by Sharon Percy Rockefeller, who is the wife of Jay Rockefeller, which I think he's the fourth or the fifth. I don't know. There's six of them now. I think you know, going all the way down. I think he's the fourth. Six too many. <laughs> That's noteworthy because the telecommunications companies were the precursors to the ed tech companies in terms of technologies for learning. Okay. So the audio visual industry was one of the precursors to the ed tech microcomputer industry. And so that's actually revealed in the UNESCO study 11 as well. And you can kind of see it if you just look at stuff like how companies like AT&T, which are right, telecommunications companies, right? They're necessary to basically provide the bandwidth for all these, you know, microcomputing courseware programs. So that public TV partnership actually 
it kind of harkens back to also Project Best again. So Project Best, one of the main contractors, because this was during a transitional period when public broadcast TV, like Sesame Street and stuff like that, was like the premiere of, I guess, what you would call the ed tech at the time through audio visuals. As they transitioned to the microcomputers, um, they had pilots for basically like early Zoom through something called the Cyclops Project out in the UK. And it was, I've got diagrams for it. You can see them on my database. It's got like a cart with a TV. The TV's hooked up to a telephone. The telephone's hooked up to a light pen. And it's got speakers that you can hear from, a microphone you talk to. So it was like hooking up TVs and radios to telephones to do this proto-internet thing. And in the meantime, one of the partners for Project Best was the Maryland Instructional Television Corporation. Okay, and it was a public broadcasting corporation. But that's, again, right, that's not D.C., but it's Maryland, same state. And so I think that's an interesting connection in terms of models of ed tech partnerships with the AFT. So that WET TV partnership is with the American Federation of Teachers. Other Rockefeller connections current with the AFT include a partnership with somebody by the name of Marla Uccelli Kashiap, I believe is how you pronounce that. But she was the Associate Director of Working Communities at the Rockefeller Foundation. Okay, and then actually Rockefeller stuff in the AFT goes all the way back to, again, John Dewey. John Dewey was one of the founding members. When he became the chair of philosophy at the University of Chicago, he was funded by John D. Rockefeller. So lots of Rockefeller money there over a period of several years. It, I think it amounted to $38 million at the time, right, which is, <laughs> you know, move it forward with inflation today. And with the help of that funding, he basically came up with this thing called functionalist psychology, which was an adaptation to the stimulus response method because, you know, Dewey came straight out of the stimulus response tradition. He studied under G. Stanley Hall. G. Stanley Hall was the first American to get a PhD from Wilhelm Wundt. And Wilhelm Wundt was the man in Leipzig University who came up with the world's first psychological laboratory. So, Dewey's in that tradition. He passes it down to John B. Watson. John B. Watson comes up with behaviorist education. He passes that down to E.L. Thorndike and eventually B.F. Skinner, who creates the modern teaching machine, which becomes the adaptive learning software that we have in the schools today. Also, the work of E.L. Thorndike, that was at Columbia University, and that would have been out of the Lincoln School. The Lincoln School was basically set up, built on Dewey's functionalist ed psych. Because Dewey moved over there and became a professor at Columbia University as well. And then the Lincoln School was funded by the Rockefeller General Education Board. Okay. And then in the meantime, right, moving forward, you have the president of the AFT, Albert Shanker. He was a member of the Trilateral Commission. I have a funny story about how I learned that. I learned it from one of Charlotte's friends, Ann Herzer, who I was in communication with by email. And she told me that she one day confronted him as to why the AFT only supports left-wing politicians. And she said he immediately, he got really nervous and started shaking her hand and saying, oh, but I'm a member of the Trilateral Commission, which I thought was pretty odd because, right, again, you're supposed to be like a representative of a public union, but you're hanging out with these corporate globalists, right, at these non-governmental roundtables. So I looked it up, and he admits it in a speech, and at this meeting of the American Trilateral Commission, he says he met, quote, with bankers and the head of IBM, and then, you know, the Trilateral Commission, remember, is set up by David Rockefeller and the big new Brzezinski, and I should mention that Brzezinski, who not just did he help set up the Trilateral Commission, but in his Between Two Ages, America's role in the technotronic era, he's basically predicting the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and his prediction is that in the future, quote, home-based education through TV consoles and other electronic devices will be the future of schooling, okay? And then he also talks about how the, quote, involvement of business companies in education may lead to a more rapid adaptation of the latest techniques and scientific knowledge to the educational process. So what is he talking about? He's talking about basically ed tech, computers, distance learning managed by businesses, that's your public-private charter school industry, 
through scientific management, that's your behaviorist Ed Psych. So all the stuff we're talking about, Brzezinski with his buddy Rockefeller at the Trilateral Commission, they were all for it, and they were hanging out with AFT president Albert Shanker. So you just push that forward to people like Marla Uccelli Kashyap in this partnership with Sharon Percy Rockefeller. And then you can see how it links up with the Rockefeller Foundation right now has something called the Great Transition. Sounds very original, right? Maybe a little something mm -hmm. like the Great Reset, which we all know is right the World Economic Forum's whole push to ram through this fourth industrial revolution. And so the Rockefeller Foundation's Great Transition basically it's got all that stuff in it, public-private partnerships, distance learning. He wants, quote, a common platform for testing, planning, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So there's your performance-based assessments. And then he also wants digital ID. That's your blockchain stuff that's going to follow you around and get tracked through the Internet of Things and a social credit system. Mm. <laughs> well, it's a big club and we ain't in it. <laughs> and now, it's not in your outline, but I hope we could save a little time at the end here to talk about solutions, because it's great to break down all these problems and reasons to avoid public schools for our kids. But let's say we've decided that we've heard you and we don't want to put our kids through these systems. What a lot of us don't know about are the best available options that will set our kids up for success. What do you consider to be the best alternative or homeschooling resources that people should be looking at? You know, I, I originally wrote the book. You know, I'm a public educator as a defense of public education, but I've been spinning my wheels hard trying to get any traction to like push back against this whole ed tech takeover. So, you know, I still think all of the five point plan I, I laid out in the book and people can listen to the other show I did with you to get those. Those are still avenues, uh, still strategies that we could apply to potentially reform public schools. But I think that in the meantime, pressure needs to be put on the public schools by opting out and by, you know, doing some more organic homeschooling type stuff. That means, right, you're not signing up for a public private charter school that's using the same curriculum and the same ed tech products. That means you're going to have to come up with a homeschool situation. They have them. I want to say the Logos School in Ohio, if I'm correct, is an example. But there are homeschool options that you have where you don't have to be plugged into a computer. You know, if you're a parent and you feel like, well, I don't feel like I can homeschool my kids because, you know, I don't know, maybe my educational background is not very extensive. You know, I don't think that's necessary. I think that, you know, it can be a learning experience for both of you. And, you know, there's other models, like I have a friend, his name is Andy Libson, he's a teacher in San Francisco, and he recently, he's at a public school, and he doesn't want to do the lockdown stuff. So he, on the weekends, has been working with a group of mothers, Comite de las Madres, and he works with their kids and the parents, they all come together at the park, and they learn together, you know, and they even talk about, they don't just do, like, basic educational lessons, but they talk about the fourth industrial revolution, they talk about vaccine passports. You talk about the great reset and strategies for that. So maybe that's a model that I, I would like to see, you know, gain some traction where people just start to, you know, learn on the park organically on their own. Now, there's this weird dichotomy where people want to have a certificate or be accredited at the end of their education in order to move into higher learning or a job or et cetera. Obviously, you don't get that from some of the things I'm suggesting, right? So going and learning organically at the park or doing some lessons, I guess, with an online tutor who doesn't have an accredited school that he or she is tied to. But learning itself should be done for its own sake and should, should be organic. So the, I think that if you can put pressure on the public schools by taking your business elsewhere, either at the home school or doing some like, you know, one room schoolhouse system at the park, I think these are ways to put pressure on the schools, you know, but otherwise there's that five point program that you could take a look at in my book and, and on the previous show that I did with Greg. Yeah, yeah. Not bad advice. I mean, we got to let the free market work, right? Because they'll pile on as much of this as we allow them to. But if we react and there's no kids in the school, then they will acquiesce and say, okay, fine, COVID shots are not required. But if we just don't react and we just put up with this shit, they'll keep piling on more and more. And another silver lining, it's great that you mention it, is this op has 
allowed people an opportunity to find the others in that same way, in the way of like, here's a bunch of kids studying in the park. Maybe I should meet these parents and get my kid engaged with these because it is true fearlessness in a culture of fear. And if you build those relationships and that network now, how are they ever going to break it up? A lot of us are on our own right now. We've just been navigating as best we can, but this forced a lot of our relationships to change. And in that opportunity, we get stronger bonds that can't be broken by anything. Because if you are finding people that you can resist this coronavirus chaos with, I don't know how they'll ever break you apart. I don't know how they'll ever brainwash you or get you into a fear campaign because this is their grand finale, if you ask me. I mean, this is the biggest fear campaign of our lifetimes, and I think it prepares you better for navigating the next one with people who are also on that same page. So it is a beautiful opportunity. I hope people are taking it. Yeah, and I should add that they're not mutually exclusive. Like, you know, you could take your kids out of the school. You could homeschool them in a program that doesn't plug them into a bunch of data mining ed tech. <laughs> then on the weekends, you could go and meet with these other families and do this organic thing in the park. And then in the meantime, since you're paying public tax dollars to support these public schools, you could still go to the public school boards and tell them, no, we don't like this. That's why I took my kids out. And hey, maybe if you change stuff, maybe I'll bring them back. So all three of these things, I think, should happen at the same time to apply pressure from multiple angles. And like you said, vote with your dollars and don't participate in stuff you don't want to participate in. I mean, I, I should just, one more thing I should add is like, as I was, me and my friend Andy were talking about, you can't plan this all the way out. You can't be like, well, we'll do this and this and this, and then the outcome will be that. All you can do is know that this situation right now, we can't just keep capitulating to it. We have to do something different. And the most immediate thing is to get out of it. And then you have to let that organically develop into other relationships that build momentum and cause the schools to react to what we're doing as opposed to we're just constantly responding to what they're changing from one day to the next. Yes. Cheers to that. And also, before we go, we got to plug the stuff you got going on. You got this BitChute channel now that could definitely use a bump in the algorithm. I think you are one of the leaders in this space and should be and should have a, a view count that is appropriate for being a leader in this space. People should subscribe to you there if they are bit shooters. But you're also working with Whitney Webb's website and a few others. Tell the people where they can find your work around the interwebs. Okay, yeah. So I wrote that study eleven piece for Unlimited Hangout. I was able to connect with Whitney Webb and that's been really cool. She's awesome. And I got another article. That we just talked about it, actually. It's pending, the one on the unions. So I'll probably be writing almost exclusively for Unlimited Hangout, if not exclusively. So you can check my stuff out there. I'm trying to do every month. It's hard to keep up with teaching and everything. In the meantime, there's a YouTube there, but go to BitChute. Because I, I mean, by the time I get any kind of traction, I know they'll just delete me from YouTube. So go to BitChute. I'll try to get on other platforms as well. The more support I can get, the more I can produce. And you know, I can teach a few less classes. As I mentioned, I'm an adjunct. So that means I have to actually teach double the amount of classes that tenure track people do because I don't have other what they call releases for administrative work and stuff. So I have to take six classes instead of three. So if y'all can help me by supporting me at Unlimited Hangout, but also I've got a database that I've been putting together. It's a web brain database. So it's got all these interlocking nodes uh, that connect like all the stuff I've talked about. It puts it in like a 3D map. It's got links to various web pages and articles related to those nodes. And then it also I've uploaded into those nodes all these rare documents that Charlotte gave me and I'll be updating it every week. I've got a few subscribers there. Like I said, it's $5 a month. That's like 20 cents a day. It's really cheap. If I can get more people doing that, I could teach a couple less classes. I can produce more videos. So those are the three main areas, a limited hangout, my bit shoot, and then my web brain database, which is at my website, schoolworldorder.info. And then there, of course, there is my book, which there's a link to that on my website as well, at Trying Day Books. Mm. Right on. Well, very cool. The book and website 
are obviously both School World Order and kudos on that excellent branding there. I hope this interview throws some fuel on your fire because you're quite dedicated and hardworking and I would just love to see it fully appreciated. Thanks for taking the time and for doing what you do. Keep fighting the good fight and take care. Oh, man, it's been a pleasure and an honor, Greg. Thanks so much for having me back. You got it. The power of Christ compels you, people. John Kleizek, breaking it all down, connecting the dots at a very deep level. It's no surprise he's working with Whitney Webb and Unlimited Hangout or Allison McDowell because they are all top-tier researchers, and they come to these interviews with such an impressive grasp on this revolving door of companies and organizations and various industry leaders and project financiers. I'm sure it can sound like an information avalanche sometimes. But we are so lucky to have people like this watching The Watchers, you know? Sometimes I think the resistance movement is reliant on a scary low number of people. Not only do I have a lot of respect for John's work, but also just anyone who reaches the levels that he has in martial arts. It's not easy. It's a real nice life asset to have, as long as you can avoid the kind of Cameron Poe Con Air situation. You got to register your hands as lethal weapons and all that. But as for his work, I just wanted to highlight how goddamn accurate he was right before COVID hit. That first interview was great and his book is awesome, but the timing was super unfortunate because we recorded it when I thought it was still pretty easy to write COVID off as a news cycle scare, another bird flu or something where it's just a news story for a couple of weeks and then it's over. And in between recording with John and releasing it to you guys, that is when we went into lockdowns and all that shit. So for me, I felt weird putting out an episode that didn't address that stuff at all when it was clearly at the forefront of people's minds. The material was very related, but the predictive nature of what he was saying in the book and in that first interview, it doesn't hit as hard when... We're seeing it enacted and we're all under a lockdown. It's like, well, duh, anyone could predict computer-based learning now. But don't forget how long it takes to write a book. So he was on these things well, well in advance. And when I see John doing presentations on his YouTube or BitChute with under 100 followers on his channel, something is wrong. And one of my favorite parts of what I do, one of the perks of this job, that does actually keep it fresh and motivates me is when I can really make a difference in the attention and appreciation that one of our guests gets. Obviously, sometimes I have someone on like David Icke or Andy Wakefield, where THC is just one of many interviews and we're probably actually on the receiving end of more new exposure than they are. But other times, THC is a nice bump from what a person might be used to. It's all relative, but in those times where I feel like it does make a difference, it feels good when I can feel like putting a show out with them is contributing to that work paying off. And this kind of research can be tiring and isolating, and you got to be really persistent and dedicated. And when you feel like there's nobody to talk to, and you're looking around and all the sheeple just don't know what you're talking about or see why it's important, huh? I mean, think about how it feels to just be the kind of person who listens to a show like this and shares these general opinions and philosophies, but you can put it down and take a break anytime you want, and by contrast, scale that up to being someone who puts in the hours to know a subject like this inside and out, writes the premier book on the subject, and still feels that odd man out feeling from time to time. It takes some real perseverance, and I respect it a lot. That's all I'm saying. In higher side news, I have been inspired by Pam Popper and No Agenda, actually, to try and have a real-world meetup here in San Diego. I want to meet more locals who are ideologically aligned, 
My wife would probably like to meet some cool moms, and I want to get a better grip on which businesses and business owners are on our page. And I have a decent opportunity in what I do. I should use it. It might not be there forever, you know? So I have a place in the gas lamp picked out. It should be great for a casual hang. I'm going to do it sometime in September. And I think the best thing to do is to just put out an announcement in the podcast feed on its own, rather than tack it on to the end of one of the next few episodes. Maybe I can rope in Alex from Skeptico or Sophia Smallstorm to hang out with us. I don't know. But I don't want to do a convention or a presentation or anything like that. But I do want to have a nice cathartic hang with like-minded people. And I've even thought about building out a part of the website in the future where people can host and coordinate their own THC meetups across the country, whether I'm there or not. Because I'm sure a lot of people feel like I do. We do have the forums, which, you know, there is a thread for organizing meetups, but it's not getting the kind of volume that an announcement on the air is going to get. All right, and another thing. So I wasn't going to plead for anything extra just because we're having a baby. I certainly would appreciate more plus signups, as always, but I'm not one to ask for anything more than that at this point. But I have gotten a fair amount of emails and messages about wanting to contribute a little more or asking about a registry. And (laughs) honestly, I, I think a registry is a bit too personal. But people have said, hey, man, I wanted to throw you a little extra cash as a congratulations, and I can't find a convenient way to do it. And that's true, there isn't one, because I don't typically uh, ask for more than a Plus subscription, but I guess I would just say that if you're one of those super kind and generous people that would want to throw me a few extra bucks as I'm stepping into this new chapter of life, you could use PayPal to send me anything by using my email, thehiresidechats at gmail.com, Or I'm also on Venmo as Greg-Carlwood. There should be only one. And the profile image is of my upside-down dog, if you want to be really, really sure. And I feel kind of icky right now. (laughs) I see so many, hey, I'm getting married, buy me a shot, here's my cash app, window writings now. And I just think it's kind of a tacky trend. But I do have this network of listeners and a show committed to sponsorship and ad-free listener-supported income, though it's not like people ever really get a baby bonus at their jobs, but they certainly should. (laughs) So for those people who have asked, thehiresidechats at gmail.com through PayPal or Greg-Carlwood on Venmo, and of course you could send anything to my P.O. Box or crypto addresses, which are both in the show notes. But ultimately, really, all I want is for more free listeners to opt into hearing the full show because it helps our guests as well. It's less than 100 bucks for a full year and the complete archives. You get everything I've ever done in the Plus Show RSS feed. That's the support I prefer because it's on merit and it's not just me asking you for something. You're deciding to purchase a service you like. And even though all the books on subscription-based businesses say that if you have 3 to 5% of your free audience opting into the premium service, that's about as good as it gets, I refuse to believe that. I know every free listener would enjoy a second hour of the show, and I should be able to get them just on the quality of the show itself. Maybe I'm naive, but in today's episode with John, the extra hour is full of good stuff. Well, not good stuff, but bad stuff that it's good to know about. The formation of vaccine passport partnerships in the schools and what's going on right now and who's involved. The history of behaviorists in education, tech, and R&D. Eugenics in education and American history. Globalism and test communities for new education programs. The Watson AI program and school authorities and the call for mandatory COVID vaccinations for good measure. John definitely deserves a solid attaboy for all he does. I know I'm laying it on thick, but it is that part of the thing. This episode pairs really nicely with the last time John was on. The whole thing about corporate-sponsored micro-credentials was pretty messed up. 
on top of everything else. I do hope John does put together some resources or becomes a resource on the solutions side of all this. I would guess that that's in the cards, but encourage him to do so if you agree with me. And I guess that's it. I'm getting out of here. I've done my part. Your move, EdTech tyrants, big data desperados, and archon-controlled criminals of childhood development. Your fucking move. Have a drink and a smoke. Listen to the cast. We shine a shiny spotlight. Put criminals on blast. The pinstripe men of morning and families of finance DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild The kids don't stand a chance The kids don't The kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance I said the kids don't The kids don't stand The kids don't stand a chance We're looking for the answer to questions never asked So we come to the Carwood For the higher side chats The pinstripe men of morning And families of finance DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild The kids don't stand a chance The kids don't the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. Involved in shady business. We try to get a glance. We're working on the numbers. Resistance must advance. The pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance.